Welcome to the Salon. On this episode, four-time Tony Award nominee Tova Felchu joins the discussion as our panel dishes on Passover traditions new and old, Catherine Bigelow's historic Oscar win and Barbara Streisand's introduction, women and the healthcare bill, and more. Join us on the Salon. Hello, I'm Jane Eisner, editor of The Forward and Forward.com. And I'm Rachel Sklar, editor at large for Mediate.com. And this is a salon where last time we discussed Jewish movies at the Oscars, and this time we get to discuss the first uh, female best director. But first, I'd like to introduce our guests. To my left is Tova Felchu. Her Tony nominated one woman show, Golda's Balcony, is opening in San Diego at the Old Globe Theater on April 28th and it's running through May 30th. So for those of you in the San Diego and Orange County area, you are in for a treat. And to her left is Susan Weedman Schneider, the founder and editor-in-chief of Lilith Magazine. And we also have with us Julie Klausner, author of the memoir, I Don't Care About Your Band, What I Learned From Indie Rockers, Trust Funders, Pornographers, Faux Sensitive Hipsters, Felons, and Other Guys I've Dated. Welcome to you all. Um, yeah, so let's get uh, started. So I was distracted by the fact that I had also dated all those guys. Um, uh, but yeah, let's get uh, started talking about Catherine Bigelow. This is uh, still very exciting for me. Kay Biggs. Yeah. Director of The Hurt Locker, she made history as the first woman to win the Oscar for Best Director at this year's Academy Awards. I just want to read for a moment something that Barbara Streisand, a director herself, had, had written on her website. She wrote, in 1992 was called the Year of the Woman. So in 1993, presenting the award for Best Director, I said, Tonight, the Academy honors women and the movies, but I look forward to the time when tributes like this will no longer be necessary because women will be honored without regard to gender, but simply for the excellence of their work. Well, the time came. It's 2010. 17 years later, Barbara Streisand gets to give the award to Best Director to Catherine Bigelow. Tova, have things really changed in Hollywood for women? Has it changed? I think that these watermarks are very important. Mm -hmm. I think that that's how one starts. First you want to get it accurately, then you want to get it excellently, then you want to get it effortlessly. So we may not be at the effortless part of gender, a gender equal society, but we are beginning to have repetitive behaviors that are uh, welcome and leave a much more open field for women. I sent my children to single-sex schools to make sure that the little girl had an opportunity to be uh, a mathematician or a scientist, and indeed she's a physics major at MIT. Wow. Because That's nobody amazing. said no. When you're at Spence, nobody says no. Mm -hmm. Brandon at Collegiate is a great singer because singing was a man's domain at the boys' school. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a, a wider, more open splay. And um, has things changed? You know, the aging process to an actor in Hollywood is far crueler on the West Coast than it is on the East. We're still in live entertainment. And as long as you've got the chops and can still cut it eight times a week, mm -hmm. like <laughs> Angela Lansbury can That's right. beautifully in night music, uh, uh, then you become more and more prized rather than less and less prized because, uh, like it or not, the field starts to clear. I have much less competition now than I did when I was beginning my mm -hmm. career. On the other hand, in Hollywood, um, uh, people like myself, uh, Blythe Danner, people who were considered leading ladies on Broadway. Over there were considered a actors who were fine actresses mm -hmm. rather than movie stars. Mm -hmm. And that's both a liability and an asset. But it, it doesn't, you, when you're not deemed bankable for a, for a movie, that is, if you they hire you, there's going to be asses in the seats of those movie theaters. It's problematic to grab those, to grab those jobs. Well, there are people who say, though, that um, the Hurt Locker is really a man's movie. It's about war. It's about soldiers. That um, it's not a typical woman's movie. Do you think that made a difference in this decision? I think she had a piercing understanding of where she was coming from, and therefore it worked. You know, um, I was just reading an article in New York Magazine about uh, if we had if women ran Wall Street. That was the title of the article, mm -hmm. and it talked about the presence of testosterone in the male body, which we also have, but they have 15 times as much, and how it influences snap decisions and risk-taking. 
So very often, like my son was at Blackstone and at Tiger Global Management, the older people hire these wonderful, brilliant young bucks who come in, young males, who then start to run Wall Street, and by the time they're 45, right, they're but retired. That's, that's the point where, you know, if you're going to talk about institutional, um, not sexism, but maybe bias, that's the point where it begins, where there's a, a predetermined sort of assessment of what's going to, you know, what are the qualities that you want to have in a, a worker or who you identify with over a drink. Um, you know, and, and we're seeing less and less of that in our generation, but I'm definitely still conscious of it here and there. There's no question about that. It's I think much that there's though. another question that arises, which is, is the exception what in some ways proves the rule? I mean, we had Golda Meir running a country. Did that open the door for other women in politics in Israel? Maybe yes, maybe no. You know, maybe having a figurehead or having a Catherine Bigelow means that for all these fabulous women filmmakers, and there are women who are certainly getting... Um, star billing at indie film festivals and so on, making documentaries, making dramas, making comedy. It, does this open something up or is this really just sui generis? You know, I think all it studies. also opens up opportunities for other women, like you were talking about other older actors. I mean, Julie Christie had the role of a lifetime because Sarah Polly was at the helm. I mean, women are generous to other women professionally, and that's something that girls, I think, need to learn sooner rather than later, that they're wasting their time kissing up to guys that they may as well be either dating or competing with and make friends with the women in your industry because those are the ones who are going to give you the jobs. And Tina as far as another great example of that, you know, all through her career, she's given great roles, mm -hmm. great media roles to uh, the woman that she's worked with. And so stop with. competing and start making friends because those are where your jobs are coming from. And as far as what Barbara Streisand said about, I look forward to the day when these tributes aren't necessary, it reminds me of that Chris Rock joke before Barack Obama had been elected saying, I want to be able to tell my son, or I don't want to be able to have to tell my son that he can be anything. I want him to be able to see by example. And as far as Catherine Bigelow's win, I'm just I'm thrilled that James Cameron lost. Is that bad? <laughs> I just think of it as Avatar losing more than anything, and not just because they used to be married. <laughs> there was if this is all happening, there. if this is all happening organically, though, do we still need, do we still need things like you know the rule in the Indian Parliament that a third of the members be, um, be women? Do we still need to there's move afoot now to perhaps change some of the gender bias language in the Canadian national anthem? Yeah, do we, we still need Canadians this kind of thing? Here. <laughs> so I think we don't have to worry about. It. They should worry better about pay equity and you know right. better better childcare and various kinds of rights issues in Canada than the wording of the national anthem, which nobody sings so clearly anyway. But, <laughs> <laughs> Except during the Olympics. <laughs> yes, well, it was practiced. But I do think that the idea of of 30 percent doesn't come out of nowhere. You know, there's somebody who's done awfully interesting studies of the business world of Wall Street, Virginia Valian, who says that until you have about a third women in a boardroom, in a meeting, that what an individual woman is saying in that context absolutely is not heard. You know, it's like that wonderful cartoon where a woman makes a comment and 10 minutes later, man makes the same comment and the person in the chair says, I like very much what you said, Mr. Smith, and I liked it very much when Miss Jones said it 10 minutes before you yeah. did. Like when a tree falls. <laughs> right. But, uh, so who that amongst us has not had that experience? No I, question. I'm, but you're saying that, th that there's actually been research showing that that yes. is, if you will, the tipping point? Yes. That you have to have about a third of any minority for, make, for there to be an actual sense of movement where the person who has broken barriers, whether it's Barack Obama, whether in this case it's Catherine Bigelow, is that going to be something that's going to open a huge opportunity or is it a certain kind of window dressing until there is that critical mass? You don't have enough support, which is why I think it's so great, Julie, that you said there should be, you know, friendship rather than competition among women, open doors for women. When I say that I'm, I'm the editor of a women's magazine. The entire staff is women. <laughs> so, you know, the, the artists are women. Most of the writers but, are women. But I think that's an excellent point about the tipping point because you are going to be dealing with either critical mass, with either quantity or then you have the backwards and heels comparison, which is that either you have to have, you know, a, uh, a summit of exceptional women who are all on the same page, or you have someone like Tina Fey, who is beyond exceptional, who is 
fabulous in so many ways, who was able to succeed in a man's world and then do it on her own terms and be beautiful and be glamorous and be brilliant and smart and funny. And does that make things easier for women in comedy? In a way, but in another way, she had to do everything a man had to do times a million in order to get any in kind of In other words, backwards and heels. <laughs> but still, well. in incrementally, this, this it, it's like a sculptor chipping away at a great piece of marble. It, this it can't be discounted. I don't. I don't think it's just a tokenism. I think mm -hmm. it's the beginning, and then we need that quantum leap, and that quantum leap is established through through that, as you would say, the turning point. Speaking of uh, women who broke barriers, uh, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, is being credited with um, doing a great deal to pass this health care reform. Whether you agree with it or not, she certainly deserves a lot of the credit for what happened there. What's going to happen in terms of the future? Do you think that this is going to mean that she will be looked at differently as speaker? Do you think that there's going to be more of this kind of legislation happening? I mean, I'll, I'll jump right in. Uh, I think Nancy Pelosi has had a lot of mockery and a lot of, you know, she's taken a lot of hits. And I, there's no question in my mind, a lot of it is because she's a woman. I'm, I'm trying to remember who it was who made a Botox joke, and then I'm thinking probably a number of people have made Botox jokes, and you just don't get those about male members of the House. Um, and, uh, but I think that, you know, she really, she showed her mettle here. And, you know, it's what they're saying about Obama too, like, whatever you think about the bill, like, he got it done, and she got it done. They pushed it through, and it's a landmark piece of legislation, and that's history. You know, and, and that's, yet that's in the, strength. This morning on television, a wonderful shot of Nancy Pelosi, who was referred to as the 70-year-old Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. No, but the the fact <laughs> and is, and that, that wasn't she, about her experience. It wasn't about her experience. <laughs> but she knows how to do politics, mm -hmm. and she was not there as a neophyte, and she was not there because she looks good in her suit sitting behind the president when he's speaking. Though she, she does. Knows, she does. She, she looks right. fabulous. But she knows how <laughs> to do the kinds of political machinations that make things happen on the Hill. She's well, an experienced and Communication is the currency of politics. It's shocking that there's not more women involved. I mean, isn't that kind of... It's Probably just like, that 15% testosterone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, to exactly. It. To have a third, maybe it would have gotten passed a lot sooner. Maybe. The thing with Wall Street about if women ran Wall Street, they talked about the women who are on Wall Street, and there aren't that many. Mm -hmm. But those who are good are not good. They're brilliant. They're fabulous. They're brilliant because mm -hmm. they're able to stay, maintain a steadier keel. Well, they've what, been hazed too. When you think Somehow about you know starting out in finance keel. and all of the you know, fraternity-like atmospheres you have to endure. And, I mean, you, you're you in it. If you're still in it at the end of that, then you are the best of the best. There's no and question. it must be a very scary environment. I was looking to do a story on Jewish women on Wall Street. Yeah. And, and as I was asking around, there were very few informants. There were very few people who wanted to be kind of out publicly as spokespersons as women, as Jewish women, potentially as feminist Jewish women it's in that anonymous. milieu, that there was a real guardedness uh, still. Well, I think if you have managed to make it in that world, like Nancy Pelosi, right. you have learned what you need to do, not in a, not in a cruel way, but what you need to do to survive. I think to, probably to too, when yourself. you started makes a difference. <clears throat> um, you know, by the time I got, to, I used to be a lawyer, so by the time I got to my white shoe firm, you know, our class was made up of like half women and half men, and I had never, frankly, never had never occurred to me to notice the difference. Um, and uh, I remember uh, my partner advisors, this big banking partner, uh, took me out for his obligatory lunch. We had this like, um, you know, stilted lunch together, and then the next day. Um, I was in the lobby to, for another lunch because this, this was in the time when lunches at law firms were the rage. Um, uh, I saw this same partner with a couple other alpha partners and three of the like young buck uh, summer associate guys, you know, joking and going out for you know that optional lunch. And it was my first time. I was like, oh. That's the glass ceiling. And I, you know, I actually didn't really want that career. I was sort of doing the law thing and then I'd move on. But, um, but had I been sort of ultra ambitious and competitive in that environment, it would have driven me crazy. Crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, for some of us, that's what we had to do. I was the first woman in so many of my jobs that I, I have Which honestly jobs? lost count. 
uh, uh, well, the first woman to be editor of the Forward. I was the first mother that was ever a foreign correspondent at my newspaper. I was the first woman editorial page editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer. I mean, you name it. Uh, I feel very, very fortunate to, um, to stand on the shoulders of the great women who paved the way before me. But I also remember feeling like I didn't know quite how to deal with it all. When I became editorial page editor, I was interviewed by the local uh, newspaper, and they said, what did you, um, what's different about you than your predecessor? And I said, oh, I don't know, stretch marks? <laughs> and that became the lead of the story. <laughs> That's great. Why did you ask me about it afterwards? That's great. <laughs> That's great. It's good for you. But anyhow, but you know, there is this sort of sense that we have to pave the way, but then we also have such a tremendous responsibility. I mean, I'm so pleased that there are so many women editors now at the Forward. Where, where, you know, it's taken a while for this to happen, uh, but it's happening. And we have an obligation to help others as well. There's just no doubt about it. And there is something of a, of a generational difference. I gave a talk recently, and I always like to say, mm, you know, this idea comes from so-and-so, and these new blessings for Passover written by Marsha Falk are so interesting, and Rabbi Susan Schnur has written a beautiful Miriam's Cup blessing, and I'm attaching names to the things I'm speaking about. Some woman came up to me very angry and accused me of name dropping. She said, you know, this kind of, you know, braggy way that you're dropping names mm -hmm. in your time. I said, I, this is a matter of sort of giving attribution and way giving, to get the point giving also. COVID, you know, giving <laughs> honor to the people who have done this kind of thinking and getting those names out there. Sure. How else would we find it? And how else would we I would give, be able to find it. I, if we aren't naming the people who are doing the work, naming the up-and-coming politicians or the up-and-coming women in the law firms or the filmmakers? Well, speaking of Passover, Susan, you've given us a perfect segue yeah. because yeah. it is um, upon us. Uh, there are now all sorts of new Haggadot, uh, that, you know, the kinds of books that we use for the Seder, uh, including several women's Haggadahs, including a new man's Haggadah. Do Isn't that the Haggadah I grew up with? I'm yeah. 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 I know. Haggadah. Mr. Maxwell House. <laughs> yes. Uh, is it important to have these gender-oriented Haggadahs? Do you, any of you? <laughs> I agree with Rachel. Isn't that like the... Isn't that the Haggadah I grew up? It's like uh, when they had the man show. It's like, do we need the man? Isn't every show the man show? <laughs> I don't know. That was just... extra man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that extra, that extra 50 that pounds beer. on each of them. Yeah. Yes. They did feminist satyrs in New York, a group called Mayan, um, starting about 10 years ago. And they were hugely successful, like 500 people turning up for each one of four nights. And at the end of one of them, someone came up to a man, approached one of the organizers and said, you know, but what is there for us? And she turned around and said, we call it Judaism, but the, you know, <laughs> it's like saying wasn't the, wasn't the old Haggadah. The, right. the well, I mean, I do remember sort of you know I used to I was that kid at the at the seder, you know I would like gender neutralize the language uh -huh. on my own. The and, simple child. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and uh, and you know and and noting that there weren't women in the Haggadah. I mean, I, we had this discussion before. Um, before this, like maybe like a glancing mention of Miriam. Well, we Africa. have a we have a Miriam's cup always on um, on our seder table. Um, I feel very attached to it in part because my youngest daughter is named Miriam. Uh, anybody else have any seder traditions? My parents will still like shake the table when it's like, oh, Elijah's drinking the wine. <laughs> <laughs> That's just kind of to make right. us laugh. And then, all right, Dad. Yeah, we use the Haggadah that my father used and my grandfather used. That's how retro oh, it is that's because wonderful. they're all marked up. They have the names. Do they so have the food stains on the? They have the food stains. <laughs> and in order <laughs> to get great. more, we went on eBay. It's it's light blue Haggadah with dark blue writing, and uh, they're piled up. I remember I was brought up in the belly of the conservative uh, movement up at White Plains with Rabbi Gelb and Gerson Cohn. He would come up from the theological seminary. And my father always wanted to sit front row at, at high holidays in the gym of Temple Israel, because Gerson Cohn was speaking. Wow. So he said, we don't have to be in the main sanctuary. Let's go down and hear Gerson. <laughs> but anyway, those, those Haggadahs are there because my father would write in the names of who would read certain passages, mm. and all those people are gone. So they're annotated. And my brother and I, they're annotated. My brother and I still have them, and that's why it didn't dawn on us, other than putting an orange on the plate, yeah. 
to to do a more feminist bent on this. Though. By the way, Tova, I was upstairs with Rabbi Turetsky in uh, oh, Temple yeah. Israel. Just so you know, we were in the same building. Oh, I love him. He married well. us. I, 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 he, well, he bought mitzvahed me. So. Yeah, I, I loved him. But uh, but I think that there's a good point to. I mean, we connect to the tradition. So even if it is sort of male centric, and we have the like sort of Lisa Simpson-ish, like 13 year old girl right. who's going to say the simple child, that was me, yeah, uh, the wicked child. Uh, it's there's still something to the tangible, you know, your, your father's handwriting and the, the stains from the brisket from a couple years back. And yeah. maybe it is a little archaic, but the updating comes with the conversation and the tradition is, you know, the one that doesn't move. Right. That's, I, I, I mean, always, that's sort of like the national anthem. Mm -hmm. right, but know? I think that it there's a lot it. of opportunity in Passover, which is so terrific. The reification, it's so concrete. I use little tiny silver Kiddush cups that my grandmother brought wow. from the old country right. in 1904. Mm -hmm. Wow. Important. And there are six of them, so I have to make sure they're like spread out around the table. Mm -hmm. But some families have people sign the back of the Haggadah with the year, and some families have a tablecloth where everyone signs and then she embroiders later in the year over the signatures oh, so year God. after oh, year wow. after oh, year. Oh, that's God. amazing. Now, these are so marvelous I, I, and they're so female because they are so rooted in protecting not just the words that we say but yeah. the connections to the people who are sitting around those tables. And the, and the taste and the smells, we, we have um, uh, my grandmother's silver and when I inherited it we cautioned it one year so that we would just use it for Passover. It took forever, but it was so worth it. And it's in this cabinet, and it's always locked during the year. And when I get around to finally setting the table and opening up, mm -hmm. and the smells come forth, this was old silver from England. Sure. It really, and really smell means, and memory. Oh, it just means a lot. Plus, I just I think in a certain way, Passover is the most radical of holidays because every every seder is different. There's, you know, it's there's, like a, there's a, no, there's no authority standing over you saying you must do this way and must do that <laughs> telling way. Telling Susan, it's like a script that you sort of punch up every year. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. exactly. I mean, even if you, we run very long and very, you know, complete seders, but even if you say everything, there's so much more you can add, and the composition of people around the table just will make all the difference. And actually, in the great world. lessons. I mean, interesting lessons. You know, there's, there's, they're complicated lessons, mm -hmm. like the, the anti-slavery lesson, you know, the mm -hmm. freedom lesson. But there's also the question of like, uh, uh, what is freedom worth? And you know, Moses slays an Egyptian. Like if you really are gonna get into the nitty gritty of discussing the Passover story and you know, God as a God of, of vengeance and violence, like there is, there's definitely a lot to sink your teeth into there mm -hmm. and to have really interesting talks and you know, and to have those discussions with your children. One of our uh, nieces married an Egyptian and he came to the Seder and I said, Gamal, this may not be your night. <laughs> <laughs> but he was at our table, and let me tell you, it gave you pause, because there really is no enemy in this world when you're eyeball to eyeball. I mean, notwithstanding Al-Qaeda, who just you know wants to slit our, th kosher us like a, an animal and slit our throats, but I have noticed, I, I've, I've so been so exhausted by trying to bring Middle East peace to the planet that I've now gone to this new thing which is called Middle East Peace One Hug at a Time. <laughs> so it was very interesting to do the Seder in his presence. Mm -hmm. Not I not bet. so not so easy. He's a good guy, you know. Just was he's on the wrong he's not on he was on the wrong team for that night. For right, yeah. But you're in his face. It was very interesting to be in his face. Did wild. you find that it changed anything that you said or did? Well you want to bring grace to your table and inclusion. I'm a member of B'nai Jesh, and one of the earmarks of that synagogue is its sense of inclusion. They changed everything in the prayer book long before I had any consciousness about mm -hmm. it. Everything was, uh, new to, you know, the gender. But it, 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 this sense of inclusion and checking if he's okay. And I said, I can't apologize for our, our people. This, this is our mythology or our story. And we're uh, grateful that you've got the, the stomach to come tonight. And, he was, he was lovely, you know, he's, he's all smiles. He knew what he was doing when he married our niece. So. Ah. <laughs> but some of it also is just the textual glosses. The Haggadah that I really enjoy using is a conservative movement Haggadah that has fabulous marginal glosses where they explain why is the number four significant and, and they talk about the plagues and the reason for the plagues that, that the Egyptians worshiped. The reason that there is a plague of darkness is that the Egyptians sort of in their foolishness worshiped us. I'm paraphrasing, sun, forgive sure, me, sure. the sun. sun and, and the reason that they're insects is because the Egyptians in their idolatry worshiped, you know, scarab the beetles. Scarab, right. And so as you're going through even the explanations, there is a s 
a sense of peoplehood forged by how we are different from the surrounding yeah. nations. Yeah. When you have someone at your table who is, as you say so well, Tova, playing for the other side, sort of, <laughs> um, there's a sense of uneasiness, not just about what is in the Haggadah, but also about how we see ourselves as a people. Well, and also your, your humanity and your, the whole, it's in your home. Right. And people should feel welcome to your home. There are things that's that go actually written below, in the Haggadah, below, welcoming everybody, welcoming that's right. all the strangers. It goes below religion and above religion. It goes to the mm -hmm. uh, religion of being a human being. One of the most moving things that's ever happened to me is I met a doctor whose first name is Isaldine, a Palestinian uh, cardiologist who in the Intifada was always allowed to cross the lines because he worked at a Jewish hospital. Well, uh, one of our boys in the IDF, one of the 18-year-olds who serve and protect the country, an errant bomb went into his house and three of his eight children were killed. Mm -hmm. And he stuck with peace. He never gave up on it. And he said, people listen to me now because I lost three of my kids. And one of them was in critical condition, the fourth child, and she was dying. And the Jewish doctor swooped down on this child and saved her life. And she just, they moved to Canada. She graduated from mm -hmm. University of Toronto with an engineering degree. But these Jewish men s swooped in to save the, 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 ch the child if, as they could have of Dr. Isildine uh, Abuasius, I believe is his last mm -hmm. name. But that was something, seeing him walk the walk of peace despite the loss of three of his eight children. Wow. It just takes your breath away. So that's my theory about one hug at a time. Well, that um, puts a nice pall on things. <laughs> <laughs> and happy Passover to you. <laughs> Let story. my people go, right. This is what happens here, though. We, we talk about stuff. That's right. And real stuff. <laughs> Things are going to stop so. getting polite and start getting real at a certain point. Well, well let's, if, if you don't mind, let's just uh, turn our attention a little bit. Passover is a holiday uh, that often is hard on women who have to do all the work and preparing and everything. Um, how does that work in a post-feminist world? Are we in a post-feminist world? I think we're living in a post-post-feminist world. I think that we're in a phase right now where it's not very hip for young women to identify as feminist. Um, I think that there's a lot of confusion as to what that actually means. Uh, but I think tangibly, the rights that are on the table now are where we need to steer our attention, which is equal pay for equal work, having more women in fields that are usually considered to be very male dominated, um, and to have more female helmed projects whether it's you know, Sarah Polly directing Julie Christie or whether it's Nancy Pelosi at the helm, whether it's more females on Wall Street, um, more female voices into the mix that aren't necessarily coming from roles of tradition, which is you know, sexuality, motherhood, like just sort of playing into the roles that history is generally. Susan, do you see this us. same divide as well? I mean, do the young women that you interact with are, are they hesitant to call themselves feminists? I think that there's an understanding that um, the kind of old-fashioned notions of feminism uh, have been replaced by an idea of feminisms, plural, huh. that there are lots of paths to both equality and a shared universe which is why the, the men's haggadahs are kind of interesting, that it's a shared world. That's, it, it's curious for me, though, because I have daughters, and we always have a lot of young women, uh, say, around our Seder table. And a couple of years ago, there was actually a backlash. I called it the Miriam backlash. You know, we have the Miriam's cup, and we have the orange on the Seder plate, and some of the women at the table were sort of insulted by it and felt that it wasn't really necessary to to single themselves out, which I thought was very well, the interesting. Orange on the plate actually wasn't originally for women. It was for it was originally conceived of to, to include gays and lesbians at the table. And the original orange, um, I guess, the orange like process or procedure was. Um, uh, uh, Susanna Heschel was the one who came up with it, and, and it includes its seeded oranges so that the process of spitting out the seeds represents rejecting discrimination and oppression and exclusion. Um, so I like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, what, you know, it depends on what the label feminist means. I think that we're moving away from feminist m meaning, you know, angry, Robin, hairy yeah. armpits, you know, unfeminine. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that women of our generation are struggling with sort of being proud that Catherine Bigelow won the Oscar, but also being like, she looked hot. And understanding that, like, that's okay. You can be accomplished. You can be attractive. You know, you can be all sorts of things, and nobody should be questioning. Women are starting to let each other know that we are entitled to 
<laughs> kind of everything. It's like we're allowed to have a job. We're allowed to have a family. We're allowed to look great. We're allowed to sort of, you know, wear makeup and also kind of be everything to everybody. What I'm concerned of more is the men of the next generation and sort of where are they getting their identity. I don't think that there's an equivalent to feminism, to post-feminism, to post-post-feminism. I don't think the man satyr is going to save the next generation of guys, frankly. But I think Judaism is so performance-oriented. We're talking about Passover, leading a Passover seder, uh, appearing in synagogue, having to master at least the rhythms of certain kinds of behaviors. There is so much that women have been able to learn in the past few decades. And women are learning how to read Torah and are teaching other women how to read Torah and are uh, providing a very welcoming atmosphere. There isn't quite that sort of remediation available for Jewish men. I mean, women can come forward and say, I never learned as a kid or whatever women say, but it's not so okay for men to come forward and say, nah, you know, don't offer me an aliyah. Don't ask me to do something at the Seder. I don't know how to do it. So partly because of the very performance oriented aspects of Jewish life, Jewish manhood has a, a different cast to it. Well, well, you have a son, Tova. I do. Um, do you see this playing out in your family? Well, what I wanted to ask, first of all, in your generation, your generation, how, just a very brass tax question, how do the chores around the house break down mm -hmm. for you guys? I, I'm, I live alone, so the chores don't really get done that much. <laughs> I'm, I'm still from the pick the cup up thing. I'm still, I have, I have the most wonderful husband. We're married 33 years, and as we understand both life together and see death together, believe me, uh, th there is nothing like a marriage that makes it. And please I God, mine, mine, I believe, has come through any tunnels, and we're like these two beautiful, old, soft Capizio shoes. Remember <laughs> Capizio? And they're oh, all, you're not that old. And they're all, be <laughs> and they're all beat up, and they've got their bunions and their corns, and you can see it through the leather, but they walk together but however I'm still from I came from a patriarchal house he came from a patriarchal house and when we don't have the housekeeper who is our wife when we don't have our wife you're looking at her I'm the one with the collecting of the cups and asking could you please put it in the dishwasher and there's a part of me that's actually split as liberated as I am because I've always been a careerist and I married a man who would uh uh, the word isn't tolerate, but would celebrate my career, and that's been a... But just like in your career, if you want a role, you're going to go out and figure out who's casting it. If you want that dish off the counter, you're going to be putting it away. <laughs> it's I, more I, about control what, I, than it is about domain, I guess. Maybe, maybe that is it. I, I don't find that I resent it, but I, I know that in my daughter's generation, there's more of an equivalent of division of, of labor and division of yeah. checks at the Certainly. restaurant. I mean, we had we celebrated our anniversary. I wouldn't dream of reaching for the check in a million years. Are you crazy? And so, if that's the barter, that's the barter. You know, of course, he took me out from. Yeah, I think it still skews in in traditional directions. It's, I mean, not as much as it used to, but um, you know, when you were talking about how women are allowed to have it all, do it all, I was thinking of a conversation I had with sort of this wonderfully accomplished, fabulous woman who does do it all, and she was like, "I'm exhausted." And That's right. Jane, so, Jane Fonda talked to me about that. Yeah, and uh, sort of the notion of like there's being allowed to do it all and then being expected to do it all. And you know, her experience was in the fabulous relationship with the fabulous husband and everybody's liberated. She still found herself, you know, picking up the slack and sort of like making those trains run on time. And I think that that is it still remains sort of the experience that, that amongst my contemporaries. Women of of my generation certainly. Um, absorb that. I mean, I'll never forget when I raised three children. I had this big job, um, wonderful, you know, marriage. Thank goodness today, 30th wedding anniversary. Very wonderful. excited. I uh, feel very accomplished about that. And uh, my mom, my, my late mother, was over, and I was peeling an orange. Speaking of oranges, and putting the peel down the garbage disposal, and she said. Why are you doing that? Don't you want to save the peel and grate it and put it in the freezer and then you could have orange when you uh, peel, when you bake? And I said, Mom, three kids, big job, great husband, don't have time to bake orange with orange peel. And sure enough, next time she came to visit, she brought the orange peel. <laughs> <laughs> just to have that's, to make, that's... just to make sure that I got the message. I think that there is a certain toll that all of this does take that I hadn't recognized. My mother, who had were, did did a lot of theater work um, when I was growing up, but there was always dinner on the table. She could be directing a play, but there was, you know, I remember three days of my entire life she wasn't home. She was directing a play. I thought, this is absurd. Why isn't dinner on the table? And she came to visit once, and there I was with the telephone at my ear and raising three kids and on deadline for something.
something. And she looked at me and she said, darling, you always want things to be exciting. I just want to know, and she said it kindly, are they finally exciting enough? <laughs> and you know, wow. there is chaos around <laughs> wow. because somehow she managed to do things in such a way that it looked like there was a seamless or a ripple-free surface. And here I, there was <laughs> a lot going on, should we say, to put the kindest face on Marie it. Marie Brenner writes about the, the swans, she talks to you in her book called Great Dames, about these swan women, Kitty Carlisle, and uh, uh, the, the great women of the 50s and 60s with the pearls. Brooke with Astor. Brooke Astor. And they come in elegant. And I, I actually like to dress, and I do collect one designer. I have an extensive collection of one designer. And I dress for events. I vote for the Oscars, so I'm invited to very a lot of exciting events. And I do not show up in jeans. And my children do not show up in <laughs> jeans to my workplace. I said, if you want to come to the theater, Broadway or off-Broadway, give me this covet. Good for you. Dress. Dress. Yeah, and don't bring snacks. Like a human being. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, you know at the theater, sometimes people bring their own snacks. It's rattle, just rattle, become rattle. a yeah, no, I abso Absolutely not. My, to talk to you about my boy, we all love our children. So my, both, my, both children are in love. And my boy is in love with a girl who's more religious than he. And this girl is very interesting, very brilliant. She, he, they, met at, uh, they went to the same school. They met on a train going home from the Harvard-Yale game where Harvard had been successful. So it was a good train ride for them. But she chose Brandon. That's what I find is interesting. She chose a less religious boy because somewhere in that less um, orthodox upbringing must be something very decent and satisfying and, and, a, and an extra opportunity for this girl. Well, that's wonderful. And on that note, I'm afraid this conversation has to come to a close. I want to thank all of our guests, Tova Felchu, Susan Weedman Schneider, and Julie Klausner. I'm Jane Eisner. I'm editor of The Forward and Forward.com. Please join us uh, on our Sisterhood blog if you'd like to continue this conversation. And I'm Rachel Sklar, and thank you for being part of the salon. <laughs>